Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Jonathan Gluss, Chief Executive Officer of the Houston Arts Alliance, a nonprofit that supports and promotes artistic life in the Houston region through programs, initiatives, and alliances. Jonathan Gluss previously was Executive Director of both Pasadena, California's Cultural Affairs Division and the Evanston, Illinois Arts Council, and was Exhibition and Program Coordinator of the International Sculpture Center in Washington, D.C. He has generously agreed to share some of his insights with us, and I'd like to thank you, Jonathan, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about art and the lifeblood of a city, the economic life, the social life. What is the significance of art to a city? Fundamental question to an agency like ours in Houston. Um, it has been um, the primary quality of life component that attracts people to Houston. You know, over the last 50 or 60 years, Houston has grown exponentially, and we are very much a, a business city. Yes. But our leadership recognized early on in the life of the city that um, we have a good beach down the, down the road, but it really is about education. It's about um, um, quality of life issues such as the arts that really are going to attract people to Houston. So after the business day, you also have to do something. You have to do something on the weekends. You want to have a quality of life that goes beyond uh, earning an economic livelihood. Right, exactly. Exactly. So the arts are the way that this community is really um, invested in quality of life. So we've had the opportunity to create um, a really vibrant, diverse arts community here because of this. So let's talk about the art institutions and the arts community in Houston. Could you sketch a, a, a bit of the landscape of the arts in Houston? Well, we have, the, we have the physical landscape. So we have the museum district, which is um, 18, soon to be 20 uh, uh, arts organizations, visual arts organizations. Um, then we have the museum, or excuse me, the theater district downtown, yes. which is performing arts. You know, Houston is uh, about um, 66 square miles, I believe. Yes. So it's it's a large city. We're we're spread out. Um, so most people know us for our two cultural districts, but in addition to that, we have theaters that are all over the community. We have the the east side is just unbelievably dynamic with um, Latino-based theater companies, with um, artist communities. I think one of the things that's most underrecognized about Houston is, in fact, the number of artists that live and work here. And it's because it's affordable. Right. Um, there's physical space. And we have institutions where they can be employed. Between the University of Houston and Rice, a lot of our artists can make really good livings here and still uh, make their art. And there seems to be a, a, a very cooperative environment between the uh, the schools and the various art institutions and communities, and, and also the various funders of those um, organizations. It's, it's quite astounding how often one encounters board members who are uh, sitting on an arts organization, but also are very involved in the various universities in the region, mm. in, in, in the various schools in the region. We are a big, small town. Um, people are incredibly invested in what they're doing here. And I think one of the things that's very unique to this city is because it is a place where people can financially do well, there's a great sense of responsibility to give back to the community. So people are active. They do sit on multiple boards. They volunteer in different ways. They, um, um, they're heavily involved with their alma maters. Uh, so you see, you, you see people coming and going seven days a week. Do you see a difference between um, this city um, in terms of, of how the cultural uh, affairs uh, infrastructure, in this case the Houston Arts Alliance, or in Pasadena the Cultural Affairs Division, or at Evanston the Illinois Art Council, there are different names for these types of organizations, how they actually operate within the different environments? Sure. We're a nonprofit. So, so you're not a city We are agency. not a city department. We were created by the city um, to function as the city's municipal arts agency. And the source of your income? Um, we have three primary contracts with the city of Houston. So our activities 
are the same as the Department of Cultural Affairs, but it's through a contract relationship. And that's very much, well, there was two reasons for doing that. One is because um, this is a business city, so there is a, a sensibility inside City Hall as well as inside the community that um, City Hall isn't necessarily the best to do the community's work. And you can lose your contract if you don't do a good job. Absolutely. But then the other idea is to leverage uh, community monies with the public monies. Okay. How does that work? We raise funds uh, through foundations. Uh, I function as a nonprofit, so I have a highly engaged, highly active board um, that is busy um, raising funds for us, um, membership, events, et cetera, et cetera. It's very much public-private. Our, our relationships are the Greater Houston Partnership is our Chamber of Commerce. Right. City of Houston, Convention and Visitors Bureau, um, the universities, mm -hmm. and obviously the arts community. So we were structured really as an alliance to advance the work of the arts community in partnership with these other organizations. And the board reflects that type of a structure. The, the, the interacting um, interests of the city are, actually do come together on the board. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have, by design, representation from hoteliers, from the CVV itself, um, from the city, um, from a theater district and museum district, um, and educational institution. So do you serve as, as a marketing extension of the city of Houston and the various art institutions that, that are part of the city? We're a partner in all of that. Okay. So, for example, the CVB might... Um, the CVB is... The Convention Visitors Bureau um, continues to become more and more... Um, focused on utilizing the arts as a tool to highlight Houston as a, as a destination. But we can bring um, additional funding to them. Right. Um, we can bring the real art-savvy relationships and knowledge that they may not have. And vice versa, they have the marketing experience we don't have. Well, witness the, the fact that the AAM meeting this year is, is happening in Houston, and that was uh, in, in part organized by the CVV, and, and uh, I have heard from a number of people attending of, of, of all the different events that have been organized at different Houston institutions, uh, serving as a way to expose people who do not necessarily always visit the city, right? Uh, but who themselves are influencers of people who will visit the city, uh, of, of what a fabulous uh, place this is. It continues to be a surprise. Um, Specifically um, regarding the conference, uh, if you go to Discovery Green in front of the, the yes. George R. Brown, um, you'll see that there's um, a variety of ways that the Arts Alliance has partnered with the, the museums. Um, so we have a, a stage that is just about folk life and traditional arts in Houston. Oh, interesting. Um, and that is a program uh, that we put in place two years ago. Uh, we have one of the best recognized folk life specialists in the country by the name of Pat Jasper that we we brought on board. And that's because Houston has changed so much. Because we are this incredibly international city, we're this very diverse city historically, but also in the last 20 years, our population has completely changed. So we're really about the business through folk life program of introducing Houston to Houston. Um, so we wanted to provide this forum to really introduce um, this new face of Houston to these museum specialists. Then we have the PODS program, which is uh, in partnership with PODS, um, the storage, the, the mobile storage company. But we've invited artists from um, Houston to do temporary installations in PODS. So we really wanted to bring Houston to the conferees. Um, but we did that with the museums. So the Arts Alliance, the city, the CVB, and the museums are all working very hard together on the, on the conference itself. How do you shape your, your, your programs? Uh, do you generate uh, many of the ideas, um, or are these ideas uh, evolved in, in um, conversation with the various uh, interests of, of the city, and including the, uh, the arts community? Uh, absolutely. We have a seven-year strategic plan for the organization. Uh, that was adopted a year and a half ago. Um, 
and that plan is not, it's a strategic plan for HAA. The community said very clearly when HAA was established five years ago, we don't want a comprehensive citywide strategic plan. We went through an active dialogue within Houston that led to the formation of, of HAA. Okay. So now go do your business. So the board created the strategic plan. It was adopted a year and a half ago, as I said, and that outlines nine primary objectives. Now, all of those objectives are realized in partnership with the arts community and the business community. Okay. So in that way, and we have a series of committees of the board, um, many of which have representation from um, individual artists as well as our, the institutions that we serve. Now, there are communities in any city that are not engaged in the arts. Uh, there are people who either are not interested, not exposed, uh, they might not have the wherewithal to, to attend. Um, how do you engage those types of, of individuals? That, you know, that is a challenge for everyone. Uh, and I would say in Houston, it, the challenge is so much, well, in, in, it, like it is in Los Angeles, geography. Um, right. When people live 45 miles outside of the city center and they still live in the city of Houston, how do we get them to come into the city center to the large institutions? or how do we go out to them? And um, that is some, something that we grapple with all the time at the staff level. Um, going back to our folk life program, honestly, that is one of the reasons why we, we, that has been such an important outreach uh, effort for us, is it provides us an opportunity to actually say to these communities, we understand who you are, um, um, and let us help you introduce yourself to the larger community. If you take a look at the art institutions, there are uh, organizations that um, are dedicated to exposing art, mm -hmm. uh, but many, or, uh, many institutions are also dedicated uh, to making art. Uh, do you have a role in, in fostering um, that, uh, fostering new works of, of dance, of uh, performance, of theater? We do. Um, through our grants program, we, we provide traditional general operating support to 250 plus arts organizations. 250 arts organizations. Right. And the character of those organizations are? Uh, across the board. So, so all disciplines. Schools to studios to, uh, to you, do you provide grants to individual artists for, for public works? We do. We do. And that is actually something that has been in place for many years in Houston. Uh, and I, I'm really pleased to say, even as the economy goes up and down, oftentimes individual artist categories will be one of the first things that, that go sustained. away. Right. Um, so we provide direct funding to individual artists. We have a, a um, exhibition space, a, a very high quality exhibition space that we provide to artists um, for exhibitions, readings, performances, that kind of thing. Um, we also really encourage the partnerships. There are so many artists who work collaboratively here and, and in formalized collectives. I think to an extent it's because a lot of people come here for education, they stay, they build these relationships, and they just continue the relationships for a long time. The arts community very much reflects the city of Houston, and that, and that is exactly it. The city is one of the most open, welcoming cities that I, I certainly have ever lived or worked in. And there's a definite sense of hunger that, that Houstonians want Americans to understand what a vibrant, dynamic city we are. What does the entity that you manage look like? It's a staff of about 22. Um, we are celebrating our five-year anniversary in June. Um, I, I've had the, the privilege of being here for four of those five years. Um, we have a board of 30, um, very well-respected community leaders, um, and I'm very happy to say they reflect Houston in all of its diversities, which is very important to me personally, is very important to the agency. There, there's a great sense in Houston that there's, there's Houston and there's New Houston, and it's very important to us that we reflect New Houston. Um, programmatically, um, we manage the city's art collection, uh, so there's 400, 400 plus pieces, and that collection is growing um, very quickly because there's so much construction going on. 
And I'm happy to say it's, um, a, again, because the city of Houston was a little late in establishing a civic art program or a public art program, we learned some lessons for other, from other programs. So we're, we're focused on two areas, um, big civic projects, international artists, um, Dennis Oppenheim's uh, piece at the airport, uh, Radiant Fountains, was just uh, installed about six months ago. We just installed a piece by the Spanish artist uh, Jaime Plenza about three months ago on Long Buffalo Bayou, our um, bayou that goes through the center of the city. Um, so we're very focused on um, international artists, but we're very focused on our local artists as well in providing opportunities for them to learn the trade of, of building civic art. Uh, so we have a myriad of smaller budget projects and then the big budget projects. Are you responsible for also the whole selection process, administering the, the selection process um, that leads to a commission, um, as well as then post-commission the whole maintenance and care of the of the works itself i do i have uh, a fully staffed civic art department uh, so we have a collections manager mm -hmm. um, whose job is wholly just to um, manage all maintenance issues with the pieces from the historic paintings in our libraries to the large outdoor, outdoor sculpture then we have a project managers that um, manage all the new acquisitions our civic art director, and this is where it's slightly different being a, a nonprofit. Our civic art director uh, works with a committee of the board and uh, department directors for the city uh, in identifying the long-term goals for the program. But we also provide services to other government entities. Oh, that's interesting. So we um, have been contracted by universities, the medical center, uh, quasi-government agencies like business improvement districts to manage their arts programs. So you function as a shared services organization for other um, uh, governmental and non-government uh, and quasi-governmental uh, organizations. We, absolutely, we do. We were created by the city of Houston, but the intent was for the organization to really be the regional catalytic agency for advancing the arts. And does this function through uh, letters of understanding or, or, um, or contracts or uh, joint agreements of some sort? Uh, it's all contract-based Okay. Um, that vary from project-based to long-term relationships. And you have contractual um, monetary arrangements as well that, that support your services. So if you don't do a good job, you're not going to get hired back. If we don't do a good job, we don't get hired back and we get shamed out of town. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what, what's really wonderful about it is it keeps us agile. It um, continues to encourage us to build more and more relationships. And honestly, because our primary relationship is the city of Houston, it allows us to advance that vision through partnerships with other government agencies. And then private funds come in. So specifically, the example of um, the Jamai Plenza sculpture, um, that was funded uh, all with private funds uh, private citizen, uh, long story short, a private citizen about two years ago was very concerned about um, a, a hate crime that took place uh, in one of the suburbs. And she went to then Mayor Bill White and said, this is not what Houston is about. We can't let this um, go without recognizing it in some way. That evolved into this major piece by John A. Plenza. All of the funds were raised uh, through foundations and individuals. The largest gi gift came from the Aga Khan Foundation, uh, who will be building a, a cultural center here in just a few years. So they're very interested in, in Houston as a cultural center. So that's an example of how, because we are a nonprofit, we can work with all sorts of partners to um, advance the big vision for civic art in, in the city. Now, I'm sure that it would never happen that there would be passionate disagreements uh, <laughs> in, in, in the field of arts. But uh -huh. uh, it seems that, that you have a, have a very interesting role in which your position could end up 
also being a lightning rod for some some pretty strong feelings. Yes. Um, how do you deal with that um, without creating disaffection amongst uh, important constituents who who may feel that a resolution is not necessarily what they would want uh, to do? There is always going to be differing opinions, always, and I think that is that's part of the job. Uh, not just my job, but the agency. Um, and frankly, I think when you get into this work, you know that, that that is, in fact, part of it. But I very much it is about um, making sure that voices are heard and keeping things moving, but not moving so quickly that you don't make sure to make sure that everyone feels like they've been heard. And also, uh, it seems that that there is this common interest um, in which you can talk about the interests of the community and, and try and get people beyond their own, their own individual interests uh, to, to work for the greater good. You're absolutely right. And it's a challenge because when you're running an agency like this that is, because we're a nonprofit, we function just like any other nonprofit. Right. We have budgets to meet. We can't run in the red. I have a board I'm responsible to. I have to have those contracts going. On the other hand, we can't move so quickly that people don't feel like they're heard. Right. So short-term success can lead to long-term failure. Absolutely. And I would say, honestly, in the early life of the agency, um, there was um, a lot of opportunities for that to have happened. And um, we've had great support from the mayor's office. And I have a fantastic board. And that consistent messaging from both of them have been very important in um, advancing the organization. So the community now understands what the organization does. Five years ago, people didn't really understand what to expect from the organization. Now they, now they know how to hold us responsible. What are your priorities going forward? And, and um, perhaps if you have some programs that, that you'd like to highlight, um, you could mention some of those uh, programs um, that, that will be taking root over the next year or two. A couple of very exciting things. Uh, one is one of our areas of, of uh, emphasis continues to be uh, cultural policy. So we have been working with a consultant as well as the University of Houston on a creative economy study. Now, a lot of cities have done creative economy studies over the last few years. Um, and as you know, they take very different forms. Yes. We wanted to look at <clears throat> the creative economy here because this is a business-to-business -to -business town. So our business leadership understands traditional industry, um, and they value the arts very much as quality of life. We haven't recognized the, the economic benefit of that for-profit creative endeavor here in the way that other cities like Chicago Right. Have done. Right. Um, so we've been working on this study. We have one more round of data crunching. Uh, we hope to launch that in the summer. But I think that the, the interesting thing here is we're doing this in partnership with University of Houston and the Greater Houston Partnership. Greater Houston Partnership is very interested in this because they know that um, for this city to move into its next phase of uh, prosperity. The whole creative economy area is where, where it's happening. You're talking about taking the idea of creation and looking at what is uniquely embedded in the Houston environment and then using those as assets that exactly. will then be reinvested into an extension of the, of the economy. That's, that's very fascinating. And what that is showing us is there's 250,000 people in the creative economy here employed. Now, in Washington, D.C., they just did launch their study about six months ago. A 10-square-mile city. Yes. Um, however, very dense. Very densely populated. Highly educated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, major institutions, et cetera. Um, 65 to 75,000 employed in the creative economy there. And that is including uh, media. So advertising, PR, that whole, we're not looking at any of that. Okay. So we're, look, we're being very conservative, and it's 250,000. 
So now we're in the same ballpark as construction, as education, as um, a lot of the other industries that for years have carried a lot of weight in this city. And it's a counter-cyclical industry in, in the sense of when people are doing well and they're going outside of Houston, um, you have a, a, a certain movement of capital. When the economy has a difficult time, people are going to be spending more time within the creative circle uh, of, uh, of your city. So that diversification also creates a more balanced economic infrastructure. Absolutely. And it's also very much about messaging. When, we're, when the Greater Houston Partnership, um, our individual corporations, um, the CDB, our universities, whomever, are um, in the business of attracting top flight uh, employees. Right. They also need to know that there's the quality of life, but they also need to know that their spouses, their children, whomever, who may very well be creatives, can um, make a living here. Well, this so often happens with us. As we recruit people, um, we find that, that uh, the other family members uh, become a big part of the recruiting process, of course. And if we find a city that is too unidimensional, um, it could become a great drag on recruiting great talent to, to cities. I can't tell you how often the, the, uh, the search ends up focusing on the spouse's work as an artist or as a business person or as an educator uh, and how important that becomes to actually attracting um, that talent to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to a community. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure. And to that end, uh, one of the priorities that was set forth when, uh, when I was hired four years ago uh, by my board was that they wanted to reestablish a Business Volunteers for the Arts program. Business Volunteers for the Arts. Right. In the 80s, Houston had one of the largest in the country. It was funded by one corporation that no longer exists. Uh -huh. So it went away in the 90s, but um, these particular board members who are in the business of attracting young attorneys to this city um, wanted to make sure that they were doing everything they could to keep them once they get here. Right. So they really tasked us with recreating the BDA program, and I'm happy to say it's growing exponentially. And we're doing that in partnership with the GHP as well. Fantastic. Jonathan, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us and, and the work of your amazing organization within this community of Houston. And thank you for your insights. Thank you.